Welcome to the Plant Cunning Podcast, where we explore a relationship to plants, other people, and the mysteries of nature. Coming to you from the High Allegheny Plateau in central New York, we are your hosts, A.C. Staubel and Isaac Hill. Welcome to the Plant Cunning Podcast. Today, we are honored to have the authors of The Secrets of Romani Fortune Telling, Yasmina Vantila and Paulina Stevens. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Thank you so much for having us. We're doing great. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is going to be a really exciting chat. It's nice to have two people on the show. It's usually just one person we're interviewing and then the two of us. And it's nice to have, you know, that energy. So do you want to give us a little bit of a brief intro about the two of you and what is Romanistan? Yeah, so Romanistan is our podcast. And it was conceived of by Paulina. It's a celebration of Romani people and culture. We interview Roma from all walks of life. Mm. And just for listeners who might not know, Roma is the word that describes the diasporic ethnic group originally from India, but a long time ago, around the 10th century, and also known as gypsies. Gypsy is kind of a complicated word. For a lot of people, it's a slur. For some people, it's more of a misnomer. Depending on where you live, you might feel more neutrally or more charged about it. Mm -hmm. But most of us can agree that it's a word, gypsy is a word that non-Roma shouldn't appropriate or use unless a Romani person explicitly says, I would prefer if you call me a gypsy. (laughs) Yeah, because people have a a lot of different connections to it. The word gypped, for instance, means to cheat like a gypsy. So there's a lot of, there's a lot going on. Sorry about the, my dog is chewing a bone right now next to me. (laughs) Yeah. And so we really wanted to highlight not just Romani culture, but also people who maybe feel like they don't fit in to the, the ideal like Romani image or culture. And Paulina, do you want to pick up what your inspiration was to start the podcast? Yeah. So I grew up in closed community. So that just meant we weren't really connected to the outside world as much I was taken out of school early to kind of focus on fortune telling and I come from much Roma so we're just a subgroup that came to America maybe late 1800s out of Serbia and Romanistan I had kind of picked up and like left my community and I was just looking for a way to kind of uplift I guess or, or maybe I want to say, I think it started more as like, just kind of telling, telling our stories, I guess, like just kind of telling, telling other Roma stories, like our story and Romanistan, we don't have a country, like gypsies don't really have a country. And so basically Romanistan is kind of our way of having our community without a physical place. Like we're still a community and a culture and a people and we have our own language and we have our own customs. And so I feel like Romanistan just encompasses that without the place, but it was a proposed piece of land, I think. Like, can you explain that part, Jess? I don't know how to explain it. I don't know how to explain it. Yeah, so some people had proposed that maybe we should have a piece of land somewhere, but that really is not a popular idea because Romani people are not historically colonizers and it it really feels very incongruous with how a lot of Romani people approach our relationship with the land, especially because Roma have historically been forced into nomadism and then some Roma have come to either prefer it because it's economically more stable to travel with your work along the road or, you know, it's a way of life or, you know, number of reasons And so Romani relationship with the land has not historically been about like borders, ownership and things like that. But however, the idea of Romanistan as a stateless nation, one that we could use to represent ourselves in places like the UN and the like is extremely necessary because Roma are very underrepresented because of our statelessness. So Mm -hmm. the concept of Romanistan, I think, really works as a political idea, as a cultural idea, but we don't need to be like colonizing any land. (laughs) Mm, yeah that's really that's really cool and then you also have a Romanistan event that is coming up a festival and I was reading up about that on your website and it looks like it's going to be a fantastic event in December do you want to tell us a little bit about that we are so 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 excited because we are planning this along with Bimbo Yaga Productions 
who's that's run by Ilva Mara Rajajewski, who's a really fantastic writer and fortune teller and spirit worker. So we have a lot of events planned from uh, December 4th into the 8th, including Bibi's Kitchen, a Romani fest, or feast, sorry, Romani feast. We're going to have lots of food and some informal tea leaf reading. We'll do a literary salon of stewarding tradition, and we're going to have some non-Roma guests like Lilith Dorsey talk about ancestral, like stewardship of traditional ways. We'll do a revisal, or sorry, a reprisal of Water Always Wanders, which is a wonderful Romani show that we had put on or that Ilva had orchestrated in New Orleans at the Tennessee Williams Festival. And there's going to be a Secrets of Romani fortune telling pop up. There will be a tea salon and tassiology workshop. There's going to be an art exhibit. There are all these cool things from performances to just experiences and panels. And we can't wait to do it. And it's a celebration of LGBTQ plus Roma arts, culture, and spirituality. And we're also including some other marginalized wisdom keepers perspectives because Louisiana and New Orleans is such a really rich, diverse place where cultures mix and share. So we just can't wait. There are tickets and everything on the website and we're also doing a fundraiser uh, to help us make it happen. So you can donate to our book tour fundraiser since that's our um, ultimate event. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Congratulations. Sounds Thank like you. a lot of fun. And yeah. so how did you two meet? How did you get, get together? <laughs> this story, um, I think because it was just so random. I was kind of looking for a co-host and at the same time, I didn't even know exactly what the podcast was going to look like. I was like, is it even going to be a podcast? Like, I really didn't know exactly what I wanted. All I knew was that I just wanted to, like, talk to people or whatever. And I had saw a video of Jez basically talking about Romani rights and outsiders not using the word gypsy. And that was so new for me. Like, all of that was super new for me. I had just come out of community, like, and... I didn't even know like, what Roma were. We say Roma. So I'm like, what are Roma? What's Romani? Like, I didn't know anything at the time. And I think that, and then I had called Jess. I, I don't know. Was that I emailed you? You emailed me and then we decided to do a phone call. Because, yeah, you were just like, I want to do a podcast. We got to talk about these things. And I was like, um, I'll talk about some things. <laughs> Let's see what this is. Yeah. I was like, I'd love to talk to you, please. Like, I think I was like, thank you, probably. <laughs> but yeah. And then it just, we just kind of talked. But Jess was originally, was like, no, I don't think I'm the right fit or something. Oh, yeah. No. And, and this brings up an important point that I like to always really, really clarify with my identity. So I grew up mixed. Only my maternal grandmother is Romani. She was a huge influence on me and our family culture. She taught me everything she like ha had in her. So I identify really strongly with it, but I'm, I'm mixed. Like I've got a lot of European ancestry. I grew up assimilated. I did not grow up in traditional culture. And so I was just feeling really uncomfortable and nervous about the idea of taking up a lot of space in the community. I felt like you know, I always feel like my identity comes with a huge asterisk where it's like, I am Roma and also <laughs> this is the specific way in which I am. But Paulina was like, I kind of feel like we need both of our perspectives on the podcast. So like there are so many different ways to be Romani and connected with the culture. And then I talked to some friends about it and they were like, you're really overthinking this. And so I was like, yeah, let's do this. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a, a great combination between the two of you. And and you were both raised as fortune tellers, like trained from a young age mm -hmm. uh, in, in various divination techniques. Yeah, yeah. Both of us started around age four or five. Paulina, you were saying in the book, like, basically, as soon as you can talk, you start learning. <laughs> Literally, I mean, they're taking pictures of you, like, you know, looking at people's palms and stuff like that early on. <laughs> Yeah, in the book, you say how how you would like you were made to watch all of your aunts reading palms and mm -hmm. like shadow them all from a very young age. How, what was that like growing up in that kind of a, in environment where you know you're you're absorbing all this knowledge at a you know very young age? I think that's the best time to learn anything too. 
you know? Yeah, I think that's part of why we, I think it just comes so natural for us, I mm-hmm. think, to a degree. Like, we just, we learned things so early on. We learned about rejection. Like, we learned about, you know, the difficult parts of it. But we also learned about the the cool parts of it, too. And, like, the helpful parts and the spiritual parts. So, it's just, like, we've accepted things, like, so early on. I feel like it's really a part of our, I, I think it's a part of our offering. Like, hey, like, this is what we have to give, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I also feel like it's an interesting way to know more about your family. I feel like when, so my cousins who are also on the Romani side of my family were not taught fortune telling because their father, who I love, my uncle Jack, who passed away, was really not proud of our heritage, didn't want it shared with his kids. And that's not something I even knew until I was an adult. But I also found out that because I was so immersed in fortune telling with my mom and my auntie and my grandma even though my mother and auntie didn't do it professionally because my grandmother didn't think that they were cut out for it because my auntie was nervous and my mother only saw bad predictions. (laughs) They worked with horses. But because of that, I heard everyone's stories. I got to know so much more about their lives. And it reminds me that fortune telling really first and foremost is community care. And Mm -hmm. the kinds of fortune telling that Roma do for each other are a little different, but it's also rooted in community care. But ultimately, it's supposed to be a place where you can talk about what's going on with you and find solutions or healing or or comfort. Yeah. And and so in the in the Romani culture is because, you know, I I don't know too much, but I know in in many cultures, something like a a spiritual lineage or like, so for instance, my astrology teacher is astrology teacher he was the only one chosen to, to carry the traditions, you know, but so is it like more like that? Or is it like that every, everybody in the culture learn the, these forms of divination? It's different for everybody. It's different for each family too. Like just for an example, my sisters and I, our specific subgroup, we were taught to, tell fortune and we were told that we were only allowed to tell fortune you know we aren't allowed to have other jobs and then my youngest sister married into a family that really doesn't do that and they have kind of different beliefs towards it and it's not really something that they practice and so I believe they had said something like you know that's not really something that we do and so she's she kind of like stopped doing it but I still feel like it's a good trade to have and I'm sure she'll probably pick it up again one day or or maybe not you know what I mean but everyone is different every family's different and at the same time I think that it's just I don't know for for the people that do have it in their life it's something that before I knew about a lot of other gypsies I thought all gypsies tell fortune like I thought that way too you know what I mean not completely but just like I thought the majority which is totally not the case (laughs) because that was like the way it was in your family yeah, I was like, all gypsies are like us. You know what I mean? Mm. <laughs> yeah, I I also thought that um, for a long time. <laughs> and just the, I mean, I didn't really know any other Roma other than my small family. And so until I was like an, an adult. But in actuality, you know, fortune telling as well as a number of other jobs that were associated with like metalworking, basket weaving, performing, agricultural work, all these different cool things. They're survival trades that Roma have worked through the centuries um, as a way to carve out a living in the face of persecution or deportation or genocide, all these different things, but also as an act of cultural resilience and our skills and talents that have come with us over the generations. So a lot of families will have their associated survival trades. Not all of them still work them, or some of them might have changed over time. Like for some families, horse trading became car trading. Mm. you know so we're adaptable (laughs) Mm -hmm. but yeah some some Roma really don't like fortune telling don't believe in it think it makes us look bad like like every culture we've got infighting and (laughs) strong opinion yeah it sounds like just like a really diverse culture and diverse experiences within you know the Roma people so can you tell us a little bit about more about what you do on a day-to-day, you know, what is, what does your day look like, whether it's fortune telling or writing or hanging out with your kids, Paulina, like what, what's the day-to-day for you two? Oh my gosh. I feel like right now, that's such a funny question. I've never been asked that. Uh Yeah. I love this question. My day-to-day is so hectic. (laughs) 
because I have kids, I think it's, it's that, but I also filled my life with tons of pets and amazing friends and amazing that like family, like everything. And so I feel like I'm just constantly busy. So I wake up kind of like make the kids breakfast, take them to school. And then I'm charging also right now. And then I have to like work. I also work part-time and then I have a little store that I sometimes go to so that I'm, I'm there or driving there. And then you know, pick up the kids from school, make dinner, take the dog somewhere. <laughs> then it's just, it's, it, the day is kind of dead by then, but always doing something, I would say. Yeah. Pauline is a corporate girly and a fortune telling girly. Awesome. <laughs> so it's, it's a great combo. Love it. <laughs> yeah. For me, I, most days, I'm a few days a week at this little shop called Deadwick's Imperial Emporium in Portsmouth and I do in-person fortune telling hours there tarot palmistry tea leaf reading but I also love an event and I so sometimes I'm not there and I'm doing something fun like the Harrington Circus this past weekend or you know any a party or something like that then three days a week, I work from home. Supposedly, I'm supposed to have a day off in there. So I try. <laughs> and that's when I do a lot of the admin work that I do for our business, Romanistan. And you know, right now, a lot of it is promoting a book and planning a really robust book tour. But we have more projects that we want to work on. And so Paulina and I are always, you know, coming up with things for the podcast. And, you know, we do that regularly, interviewing people. I'm also working on a novel a little bit at a time because I'm a creative writer, too. And oh, we're planning our next big thing. And so it's right now my life is very much like, you know, fortune telling online with my individual clients or in person admin, writing, dreaming, scheming, <laughs> podcasting. <laughs> yeah. Sounds familiar too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> lots of pets. I'm like, oh yeah, we got lots of pets and yeah. <laughs> dreaming and scheming, the next big things. Next yeah. big things. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so your book, The Secrets of Romani Fortune Telling, is that it's all about, you know, divination techniques and um, fortune telling, palmistry, all these things, but it's also so much more than that. So can you give us a little overview of what you've included in the book? Yeah, we really, really wanted to create a resource to give the cultural and historical context for tarot, palmistry, and tea leaf reading, and some other forms of divination like trinket reading that are associated with Roma or have been created by Roma or shaped by Roma significantly. And so, for instance, you know, Roma likely did not invent tarot. However, we did create tarot as a divinatory tool and, you know, co-opted it that way. And it created a whole survival trade out of it. And so a lot of times when you're reading books about divination, they'll mention, oh, gypsies were probably involved somehow and then move on quickly. <laughs> and so there really weren't too many resources out there. We, this is kind of the first book of its kind where we two family fortune tellers have come together with quotes from different Roma practitioners in the community giving cultural and historical context as well as a how-to as well as a guide to how we do this professionally and what the difference is between reading for yourself and adding that kind of professional layer to it because most Roma read as a job and we kind of are distinguishing you know divination as a practice from fortune telling as the labor of divination and so, you know, it's a it's a feminist, gender liberationist, LGBTQ inclusive, like, you know, in very holistic guide to this work. And we really hope to share our own perspectives while recognizing that, as you mentioned earlier, Roma are very diverse. And this is only one little piece of um, the culture. And yeah, do, do you feel like you your goal you, you met your goal with the book I, I it seems like it was a really good book from my perspective reading it yeah for sure well thank you yeah we really have been enjoying it so yeah. thank you for sending us that copy oh that means so much to us <laughs> <laughs> yeah um I would say so I feel like we definitely reached our goal I would say at the same time there was so much we wanted to say and had to take out oh mm. yeah so I definitely like we could write a book you know just on tarot like we talk about that or just on palmistry just on this just on that just on the history I think that's so deep and a lot of people also want to know about that as well as well as herbalism like there's so many different aspects I think that it can be expanded on but at the same time I think this was a 
perfect. It has tons of information in here. And I feel like we succeeded at our goal. Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> we did our very best. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's it's also yeah you've got, you you have the historical context and you have like not not even a brief but a, a pretty good introduction to each of these forms of divination and some forms that you know I don't I didn't I didn't know anything about charm divination you know but there's so yeah you're introducing all of these all of these in, tools rather than going deep into any one of them which you can't do you know for all of them in a book anyway so yeah. But the, the, all of those things are very important. The context as well as the, the introductions to those. That's, yeah, it's great. And so what what are some of your favorite divination tools? Do you use all of these on a day-to-day basis or with clients? Or do you focus more on one or two? I use tarot, palmistry, and tea leaf reading pretty daily because I offer them all at the shop. And it depends on what people are feeling or requesting. I think I do have a special little love in my heart for tea leaf reading. A lot of times people ask me like, well, which one is the most accurate one? And I'm always like, they're all accurate. I wouldn't do anything that wasn't accurate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Right>. Sometimes I'm <laughs> grouchy. <laughs> but I do love tea leaf reading because it just brings back such happy memories of reading with my family. That was the one that I think my whole family was into the most where, you know, if I was reading palms, my mom would be like, oh, don't look at my hand, you know, <laughs> but um, my yeah my whole family would be trading tea leaves and you know trading cups over breakfast and we'd be talking about what's going on in our lives and I just feel like it's such a healing magical practice where the symbols that come through are just specifically for you but they all have their gifts and I tend to use them all and I try to have a few forms of divination that I don't offer that I just practice for myself like smoke reading or fire reading Mm -hmm. just for my own mental clarity cool And how do you do the tea tea leaf reading? Just like, I don't know if you can give us an overview of it. Yeah, you know, it's not too dissimilar from coffee reading, which is Paulina's specialty. But basically, it's you you brew the beverage, however it needs to be brewed. And you have the client drink the cup, like the all of the liquid Mm -hmm. until the end. And sometimes as people are drinking, you know, in my family, we encourage conversation, but conversation around like what you wanted to know, like what's going on in your life. It was a time to like share and dish and talk about hopes and dreams. I've heard some people drink in, in silent meditation, but that's just not really my family style. And yeah, and then at the end, you flip the cup over into the saucer and we turn it around three times and then read what's there. And there are different ways to tell you know, how recent things are going are versus like how far out things are going to be. But for me, I like to understand that, you know, my spirits or, you know, whatever I'm connecting to are showing me these images because they do mean something to me in my interpretation of it. But a lot of times they'll also mean something to the client. And so I always like to ask if they have associations because that can really amplify the their connection to it. Like I was reading for someone and she wanted to know about her spiritual path and purpose and what else she needed to do. And she gave me her cup and I saw like this possum with all these little baby possums. And I got this message that was like, she's taking care of them. And I was like, are you uh, by any chance like raising a family of possums? And she's like, yes. I was like, wow. that's crazy. Yeah. And I was like, is, is this like a spiritual practice for you? And she's like, yeah, I need to take care of all the animals on my land. And I saw that they were not getting what they needed and they needed more shelter. And I was just like, oh yeah, your spirits are strongly in favor. And so like, I didn't have all the information about what that meant because she needed to share that. And that was enough. Whereas other things, if they're like, I have no idea what that means. I'm like, well, here are all my thoughts. And so it's a really nice kind of like community oriented type of reading that I enjoy. Sounds awesome. Really cool. It's a little off topic, but I love that you said that taking care of animals is like your spiritual practice because I totally feel that way. That's so you. Yeah. <laughs> I fostered like kittens. I fostered like 30 kittens one year. And I'm literally obsessed with it. You're totally right. <laughs> yeah, that can totally be a spiritual path for yeah. sure. Yeah. What's your favorite divination tool, Pauline? I don't know if I've ever yeah. asked you that. I mean, I honestly feel embarrassed to say it because it really is tarot cards. And I feel like tarot is so commercialized okay. and like everybody uses yeah. it. Yeah, but it's like they're easy to grab and go. And like I'll like one thing I do when I'm with my daughters is like we'll go to the park. Um, They're like eight and nine. And so they're, 
definitely old enough. They've made, you know, some money before <laughs> they know how to hustle, but basically we'll go and kind of practice the cards. It's just, for me, I feel like it's, it's so comfortable. Like I feel so comfortable with the cards. Coffee reading is another tool that I do use. I also do a lot of face reading as well. Like I just kind of look at people's face and just kind of read from there. My grandmother always did that too. But really coffee reading is a little bit, I want to say newer, but in the way of like, you know, 15, 15, 20 years newer, only because it's like my parents had so many books basically of all different types of divination and my aunts I want to say my ancestors because they are past now but my you know great aunts and 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 grandparents great grandparents would mention things like yeah coffee reading and stuff like that but it was hard to do on the go like you have to make the coffee and then how are we going to do that on the street you know what I mean it doesn't make any sense or in this small corner or whatever it was so I was like yeah well we have a place now so I started reading the books and just like took it on myself but it wasn't really something I was just drawn to it it wasn't something that I was necessarily taught it was something that I knew of the way we cooked the coffee was the same but the reading part was um, new to me Mm -hmm. and in the book you you have this story about how you were learning from your aunts and watching everybody's shadowing them all watching them do readings and then you would have all these books and read every single book and you would be like these don't these rules don't necessarily match what my aunts are doing and so i, I wonder <laughs> like what how much does intuition play how much do rules play in in divination for you i feel like intuition is 100% and the tools are just like i think it's like a surgery or something like you the doctor has to be there like 100% and then you know the tarot or the face even or the palms or or the this like I feel like that can all be a hundred percent too or it could be nothing at the same time like just a tool for us to kind of see what's going on or, or what's going in and I say that in a way of I only feel that way now like it took me a really long time to feel like that and to come to that understanding and maybe not everybody feels like that but I really I really do. I feel like I could see something good and feel something bad. And I'm like, honestly, I just feel like shit. Sorry. Like, oh, sorry. Can I not say bad words? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we don't um, really have, a, have, have any issue with that. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I feel like it's kind of like that for me. Like I know that my intuition plays a huge part in it, but like because of that reason, I cannot read for myself. When I try to read for my, oh, myself, yeah. I go a hundred percent rules and I'm okay. like, let me see, because my intuition is too wishy-washy when it comes to reading myself, because I'm too emotional, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's hard to be objective yeah. when you're doing a reading for yourself. What about you, Jez? I can only read for myself on low-key things that are not highly charged, but yeah. if I am having a hard time or feeling really emotional or hopeful about something, I always ask a friend to read for me. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I also I totally agree with you. I feel like intuition 100%. I have a thing that I, my intuition works really deeply on empathy. I'm more likely to intuit a lot about people if I can find some way to emotionally connect with them, even just on the most base level. But every once in a while, you know, I work in a shop, anyone can come in for any reason. And sometimes people are abrasive and unpleasant. And that is when just, I don't know if it's defense or what, but my intuition just like shuts off. (laughs) <laughs> and so then I'm just relying really heavily on what the cards are saying. And I have like a little bit more of a literal reading. And I'm like, hey, I'm really glad I have these tools right now <laughs> right. <laughs> throughout I the totally reading. I totally agree with that. I yeah. totally agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, you know, hopefully throughout the reading, I find ways to empathize with them or connect with them. And, you know, and then it starts to come out a little bit. But I think it's like a defensive mechanism where I'm like t- not tapping into that vibe. <laughs> Yeah, because totally. you have to open yourself up to them. Yeah. <laughs> That's not what you want to be doing. Yeah, not every practitioner and client has a good fit, you know, and that's why yeah. we have referral this. <laughs> Even as an herbalist, you know, it's important to have referrals with different practitioners because not everybody's vibe is going to match. 
Oh, sure. Yeah. I've gotten much better too when I sense that it's not going to work for the person for all kinds of reasons. Sometimes because, you know, when Paulina and I sit down, a lot of times we will just say we read in our Romani family tradition. This is how Roma, who Roma are, also known as gypsies, et cetera, et cetera. And every once in a while, that'll turn someone off immediately. And mm-hmm. I'll get a vibe and I'll just be like, you know what? How about I refund you? I don't I don't think you, this is the right energy for us today. And I just I'm happy to give them their money back. So everyone feels good. <laughs> yeah. And keep in mind, too, like for us to be able to do that is definitely, I think, to a degree, maybe to a degree, but a little bit of a luxury. Mm -hmm. Um, Not a lot of. Yeah, like not a lot of people can do that. I left my community and I work in other fields. You know, I also work in marketing, like I help out doing contract work for other people. And obviously my, you know, my main thing is, is fortune telling and my practice. But I feel like it was never like that growing up. Like I have that ability um, to do that. And so a lot of people do not like we have to sit there and we have to like try our best. Let's just say like, you know, we can't eat that day if we don't make ten dollars, fifteen dollars, twenty dollars. So it's like we're in in a a position to to turn people down or, or give them their money back sometimes, like if we're not vibing with them. But a lot of the times yeah, people can't do that. Like we need to make it work somehow, some way. So at that time, you know, we're not going to tell people that we're gypsies, like we're not going to risk it. Like, and so that's why we hide our identity a lot. Mm. Yeah. And I I think too, as Paulina and I have chosen to be activists, it's like, it's become an integral part of how, what we do and how we present ourselves. And, but we had to get to a point in our lives where we could afford to be activists literally (laughs) and so yeah it's definitely not an expectation we have for like every Romani person it's just what what we felt like we needed to do with where we were in our lives yeah yeah Yeah. well that brings in the whole question of like ethics in uh, in being a fortune teller Mm -hmm. and also that difference between divination and fortune telling too because like you know they're related so you have a whole chapter on on that and maybe could you share with the, with the listeners like what are the most important ethics and what in in regards to fortune telling as a as a as a profession yeah <laughs> you want to go first um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah paulina did a really fascinating podcast series foretold with the la times that really dives into what we were just talking about with like privilege and and what you can do with fortune telling And so, you know, there are tactics that I think sometimes Romani people have to draw in business that actually are not any different than anyone else trying to draw in business. But we do get a lot of uh, criticism about it because of these anti-gypsyist laws and perceptions around the work that we do. But so we do discuss that and how there's a difference between being like a salesperson and being manipulative. And we go over the basics of, you know, of course, you're not going to try to scare people or tell them they're going to die or someone they love is going to die. But then we also talk about other things like, you know, confidentiality. We're not a therapist, but we should not gossip about our clients and make sure that they feel safe to share with us. And it's really important that we create a non-judgmental place because people from all walks of life come in with all kinds of problems. And so, you know, a lot of people go to fortune tellers instead of maybe even a therapist to talk about like adultery or something like that. But then also you might have clients from all backgrounds. And so we recommend to really acquaint yourself with different identities. You know, you might have disabled folks, LGBTQ plus folks, like people of color, and there might be some experiences that you can't relate to. And so it's important that you're not coming with prejudice and you also know how to speak respectfully to people and not, you know, be offensive or ignorant about their lives and their identities and existence. And so we have the kind of basics of like, you know, don't, don't try to manipulate people to, you know, maybe do a little social justice training and see that you can hold safer space for people and maybe like be become a little more trauma informed for you and your client. Because yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing where we're not, it's not like we're priests and it's not like we're therapists, but there is a kind of like emotional spiritual care that we're providing so we have to be responsible and respectful about that 
Totally. And especially like it's 2024, like, you know, you can look up anything like how to be non judgmental. Like you, there's literally YouTube is free. Like there's all this stuff um, for everybody, all these resources. I was able to get a life coach certificate um, online and it was like a course that I had done and over a course of I don't know, like eight weeks and they test you and like, it was super cool. But that course that I took years ago, like still helped me today, mm -hmm. but there's definitely lines. Like everybody is human. And I think if you feel like you're just crossing that line, like you're just crossing that line, just don't do it. You know, that's kind of, that's how it is. And everybody's lines are different. And so, yeah, that's kind of my, my view on it too. Yeah. There's, there's also one other thing I wanted to add in terms of like privilege and things like that. But so other ethics that we had mentioned too, is like, if you're not Romani and you're practicing these trades, like, you know, please don't use the word gypsy to describe yourself. Don't dress up like, like a gypsy Halloween costume. Be mindful of the kind of imagery that you're using. Do your best to try to learn from Romani teachers and uplift Romani community, especially if you're partaking in these survival trades, because you know, we're not trying to like take tarot away from anyone, but we are trying to recenter Roma and include Roma in your festivals and your conferences and all these different things, like really be inclusive. And also, I always like to share that, you know, you don't have to read for anyone who makes you feel threatened, scared, uncomfortable, discriminated against, which is coming back to my like, how about I just give you your money back place? Again, that's a that's a privileged place where I'm like, I'll have another client and I'm doing OK right now. I can do that. But if you can do that, I think definitely do that. Or, or maybe you can keep the money and throw them out if they're being racist. <laughs> you don't have to give it back to them. Yeah. All fantastic points. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you about the herbs and plants, botanicals that you might use in your practice. Have you, do you have any specific ones that come to mind that you want to share with our audience? Oh, me, me personally, I mean, I think that I, the first thing I think of, which totally, I don't think I'd want my audience to do this or your audience or whoever's watching this, but I just think it's funny. We always use alcohol to <laughs> deal with pain. And so yeah. they would like, you know, rub alcohol on the baby's gums and stuff like that. But for good actual herbalism, that's good for you. We do use a lot of lavender. My mom used lavender for everything. So lavender was for your skin. Lavender was for your soap. Lavender was for the scent. She would burn lavender. We would pick lavender. Like we'd make everything like she was kind of obsessed with lavender I think that rightfully so I think it's really great but one thing that we had in the book was it like a lavender milk mm -hmm. and it's just like lavender and honey and milk and that is like to help you go to sleep kind of relax like calm you down but simple things like that and some things were really other things I think they were just really a lot like a lot of different herbs that I can't think about off the top of my head but I know that whenever we were sick in our our soups we would use tons and tons of spices mm -hmm. and from a lot of different cultures but mostly eight like I, I want to say like South Asia Southeast Asia as well but like a lot of herbs that were spicy so yeah yeah like garlic and ginger and hot peppers mm -hmm. and things like that yeah totally, totally yeah, yeah. I felt like my herbalism was really integrated in day-to-day -day things. Like I, I think that Roma definitely have our, our magic and our spirituality. It's really nothing like the way it's depicted. It's super practical generally. And so a lot of the herbal practices I was raised with were very directly medicinal, even if there is another level to it. So for instance, I am a very anxious person <laughs> and my <laughs> grandmother was always having me drink chamomile. And the reason for that was for me to feel better. But also she was like, if you're anxious, you can't do a good job with the fortune telling like your your mind is not open to God in the way that she put it. And she's like, you need to breathe really deep and you need to drink chamomile and you have to talk to the chamomile and let it know that you need it to help you with this. And so she was really into like plant communication. And I think like a lot of you know, kind of more old school Roma are, and it's also not seen as magical or weird. It's just like, and because everything has a spirit, obviously. 
<laughs> and so yeah my grandmother was also really big into dandelion as like a like something that cleanses mm -hmm. and she really loved she identified a lot with the dandelion flower she would take me into the meadow oh it wasn't really a meadow it was more of a scrap of filthy land but we were um, <laughs> picking dandelion together and she would say that you know dandelion and roma are like weeds you know they try to kill us but we always come back because our roots are deep and they can't kill us and I was like okay I'm five um, <laughs> she has been through a lot <laughs> and coming from Germany and everything and so yeah and so I some of my happiest memories are picking flowers with my family and just really learning what we could eat and why it was good for us like I loved eating clover flowers and my mother, you know, couldn't totally remember what they were good for, but she's like, they've got vitamins, they're good for you. Like if you're outside and you're hungry, like you should have a snack, make sure nothing peed on it. But like, yeah, you should do that. And there was a lot of, a lot of foraging, but a lot of asking permission and, and talking to the plants. And then like Paulina was saying, when you're sick, all the ginger and the garlic and the peppers, everything is coming out. And yeah, a lot of folks think of our food as being like lucky too. like the really strong, like garlicky, pickled, peppery things tend to be lucky mm -hmm. foods, but they also tend to be the healthier foods for you and help with your immune system. Yeah. So it's very like, very casual, but very integrated. And one other thing I kind of thought about too, the way that you said integrated was like, yeah, like we ha have, you know, like lemon water every day, like, yeah. you know, or vinegar in our water, like who's doing that, like back then in the day, and like, we were, you know, what I mean? <laughs> like, we were doing weird things like that. Mm -hmm. But I guess it really did. It really did do something, I guess. <laughs> For sure. And we're, we're almost out of time, but I did before we, we finish, I want to ask about, you know, because this is about divination and integral part of divination is the divine. And I was wondering this too about because the Roma came from northern India about the, the continuation of deities. And so apparently there is Kali Sa Sarah mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you ha have that at the beginning of the book. Who, who is Kali Sarah and why uh, why is she so important? <laughs> we love to talk about her. <laughs> yeah, so she's fascinating. You may have seen an image of a dark skinned Madonna with lots of robes and flowers. And she has a very famous statue and pilgrimage in France. And it's very likely, highly likely that the goddess or saint, depending on your persuasion, who goes by several names, Sara la Kali, Kali Sara, Sara um, Kali Sara, sorry, Sara la Kali, Kali Sara, Sara Kali, and maybe the Black Madonna, et cetera, et cetera, Saint Sarah originally was the goddess Kali. And as Kali came with the early Roma out of India and moving through West Asia and eventually into Europe, probably the early Roma arrived in Europe around the 1300s, like 1370s, enslaved for 500 years in, you know, present day Romania, you know, all these things ensue because it's a tale under the Crusades. It's a really bad time for people with dark skin and speaking another language and polytheism to be showing up. And so it's likely that over the years, Kali adapted to look more like the European, like, you know, Mary or saints. And so she is both a goddess and a saint if you're Catholic. And there's lore around her that she was one of Mary's attendants and, you know, sailed from Egypt into France. And, you know, there's, it's like an apocryphal story, but it's sort of the way that Roma were like, sure, we're good Catholics. Also, we just need her with us. Okay. <laughs> Please don't ask too many questions. Yeah. And there's really beautiful pilgrimages to her, not just in France, but there's also one in Toronto and one in Mexico. And yeah, we think of her as the protector of the Romani people she sort of holds fate and free will. She obviously can't fix everything in your life, but she, you know, does everything she can to protect you and meet you with love and compassion. And not all Roma work with her, but she is a really popular Romani figure. And then depending on who you are, there are other deities who have either come all the way from India and maybe become a part of the process, like, you know, but also local saints in Europe too have become adopted in and sort of Romified. Yeah, Paulina, is there anything you want to add about that? I would say that at least like they were able to kind of keep her like darker skin. Like it mm -hmm. is, yeah, like sometimes even other Roma, like they 
sometimes deny our roots to India. And I feel like it's so important that we're able to keep some of our roots, even if they're like dressed up as these like, you know, Catholic um, saints. I feel like either way, but I, I grew up no longer anymore if you guys read the book <laughs> or whoever reads it but basically I just feel like it was a good I feel like at least we we kept something kind of that we were able to keep to ourselves. Roma lose so much uh, and I think I'm so glad that you asked about her because yeah we hold her like close to our heart it's something that they can't really like take away from us to a to a degree but yeah Roma lose a lot so mm-hmm. yeah beautiful yeah it's a really great essay by ronald lee about her the goddess saint sarah cully i think it's called and also the poet rain gay again writes some really beautiful poems about her and there's a piece about it in traveler times so if you want to learn more definitely recommend those resources awesome thank you so We are out of time for today, but this has been such an honor to have you both on. And thank you so much for being on the show and for our listeners to learn more about you. Do you recommend just going to romanistanpodcast.com? Yeah, that's a really good place to find us and follow us on social media. We're a little more active on Instagram than anywhere else, but we're on Instagram as Romanistan Podcast, but we're also on Twitter, Facebook, and occasionally even TikTok. So those are good places to keep up. I saw a book giveaway on Instagram. So if yeah, you enter into that. That's yeah, exciting. book giveaway, fundraiser. We try to keep it fun. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much, folks, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much for having us. This was such a delight. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.